Now I would like to request our guest, Mr. Gopinath, to address the gathering. Please, sir. Thanks for your kind words. Can you all hear me in the back? Yeah. <coughs> Professor Dr. Biswajit Patanaik, the president and founder of this university, uh, an extraordinarily impressive first impression that I had. And uh, I also saw your brochures. Um, big uh, kudos to you for creating such a great temple of education. Uh, Vice Chancellor, Mr. Sahu, and uh, faculty, and, uh, and I think uh, most uh, important uh, young students. Uh, Dr. Biswajit asked me uh, to share to share my story uh, rather than give a lecture uh, through a PowerPoint presentation. So I'm, I'm going to tell a story and I think those of you uh, uh, trying to pursue your own dreams, pursue your own uh, path, uh, I'm sure you can take whatever you feel would be relevant to you. This is the time for those of you who are passing out tomorrow, getting a convocation, this is the t time that you are full of dreams. Dreams create your future. There is nothing like a dream to create a future. It was Goethe, the German poet, whom I fond of quoting, who said, dare to dream and begin it. Dare to dream and begin it. Genius, it has genius, magic and power to it. I think all of Entrepreneurship can be summed up in this probably one sentence. Entrepreneurship is on the one hand and also planning your future on the whatever it could be, even if you're not an entrepreneur, is about having a dream and it's not enough to have a dream. Your dream must be combined with venture. It must be combined with adventure. Because that's the reason he said, dare to dream and begin it. Because that beginning, that from knowing to the doing, because if you have the former and not the latter, all your talent is of no use. It is not enough just to do without a dream, and it's not enough just to dream and keep dreaming. You have to combine your dream with adventure, with venture. And as Gustav Flaubert said, he said, I firmly believe that if you look at the skies long enough, you will grow your wings. So therefore, many of you who are now contemplating after leaving this great institution to start on a new life, you'll be wondering what is it that I should do? What career should I pursue? What calling should, should I go after? My suggestion would be that when you dream, you must dream your own dreams and not follow the trail of somebody else. He may be a guru, he may be an icon, he may be a, a, a great uh, entrepreneur. But I think it's important that you think for yourself. As Socrates said, in all matters, think for yourself. And when he said that, he also said, think about whatever I am teaching you. I could be wrong. So you have to follow your dreams by listening to your heart. There is that gleam of light that each of us 
have there's a prompting in our heart in our consciousness that talks to us and many of us don't listen to it because it is our thoughts but genius is nothing but your own thoughts coming back to you with a alienated majesty it is somebody else's thoughts which comes back to you and you think oh my god i thought of this i should have started this venture myself i should have pursued this particular scientific path i should have written this novel but you don't because it are these are your thoughts and since they are your thoughts sometimes you do not have that confidence to follow your heart so self trust is the first secret to success and that is giving a, a, a having a loyalty a overarching loyalty to that inner prompting that you have all of us have a inner needle a magnetic north that points to us in one direction but many of us do not have the courage of conviction to follow that particular path so we often hear people who pass out who do not get sometimes jobs get into despair get into some kind of hopelessness oh i do not have enough connections i do not have political part, uh, political godfather I, i do not have a rich father no i think you should never fall into envy envy is the worst form of disease so do not envy follow your own thoughts and pursue it because every entrepreneur every great man who achieved anything he achieved it because he had that passion to follow his dreams and so i would like to say a few things from my own life and intersperse it with what what i have been talking to you about and to make a thread between the between both of them and you also always hear that and talk about destiny when things go wrong as aristotle said choice not chance determines your destiny choice not chance that determines your destiny you are you are i'm not what happened to me i'm what i chose to become is what carl jung said the greatest psychologist i'm not what happened to me i i am what i chose to become so you need to have that inner courage to listen to your heartbeat and follow that follow that path i as you said i studied in a village school i'm mentioning it because it is not the buildings that make a great institution though you have got a great institution but it is not the buildings but it is the people in the buildings who make the difference both the teachers who will teach you and the students who learn so many of the people who are risen to great heights they rose to the great heights because they believed in that particular dream to continue and not to give up so more than talent what is important is persistence you need to persist in kannada they call it hatha i think in hindi they call it chal you have to have that chal that that persistence is more important than than any kind of luck or any kind of gift or talent the many gifted people many talent people who fail because they do not persist i studied in a village school it was a kannada medium school and i sat barefoot and i was my seventh standard one day my headmaster came and said there is a exam for a military school does anybody want to go for that and i sitting that village school i was a puny boy i was always dreaming of going out and i put up my hand so i went to hasan which is the district headquarters and i went to take the exam in the government school there which is about 30 kilometers from my village and i came back crying because the exam was in english and i had studied in a kannada medium school so i came back and told the headmaster his name was nanjundaya i still remember 
And I said, you know, I could not understand anything. Then he, which I learnt later, sitting in that village school, wrote a postcard to do Ministry of Defence because it was a Ministry of Defence examination and said, English is not intelligence. English is another language. If you want people from rural areas to join you, give an exam in native languages. And he forgot about it. After three months, he got a reply. That postcard which he threw in that post box in the village, somebody saw it. And that defense ministry, when Colonel Malik was sitting in the defense ministry, wrote back saying that we made a mistake, we're going to give another exam in Canada. So he asked me, would anybody want to go? And again, I do not know why, I was the only one who lifted my hand. And, and it was, he said there's a military exam, and I did, you know, did not even know what military was, because even in villages today in Karnataka, you find military hotel. And my father told me, military hotel means they serve non-vegetarian food, because the military eats non-vegetarian. So I just wanted to get out and become strong and leave the village. So I left the village again and took the exam and this time it was in Canada and I passed the exam. And there is a poem which I often quote in Canada. It's, I say it in Canada because maybe one, one odd student here. It is by one of our great poets in Karnataka. It says, Gudi aache, gedad aache, gadi aache, hogona baniro hosanadige. Beyond the woods, beyond the temples, beyond the borders, let us go and seek new lands yonder. But you cannot seek new lands unless you are ready to leave the shore for a long time. You have to leave the shore. The, the ship, the boat is safest in the harbour. But you don't discover anything if you are on the harbour. So to discover new lands, to discover your new dreams, you have to leave the comfort zone, you have to, you have to combine your life with adventure, and that's when you discover new lands. And the greatest of discoverers of all time who changed the world history, Columbus, was uh, Italian. He stood in the, in the edge of uh, Europe in Portugal and looked at the ocean and said, Oh my God, there must be great lands of gold. India must be on that direction because India was already spoken of in those days. That this is land of gold and diamonds and spices. So if I am standing on the land here, and there's water in front of me, there must be land on the other side, because it was thought then the earth was flat. It was not known that the earth was round. It was before the, the Copernicus time when it was discovered that the earth was round. So he went and asked the Spanish king, his own king, to give some money, so that he can take some men to discover the new land of India. But his king did not believe uh, the Italian king did not believe what he uh, what he story he said his stories of dreams. So the Spanish king, the uh, who was not next to Italy but France and uh, came in between, the Spanish king believed that and funded his voyage, and he ended up instead of discovering India, he discovered the West Indies and America. So in one sense. The first venture capitalists, since many of you are studying MBA, were the Spanish kings and not the Italian kings. They did not believe his own, his own countrymen. So it is not, but Columbus went in a very undecked boat. It was not a steam engine, there was not a diesel engine powered boat. It was an undecked boat, that means it was just on sails and rowing. So what courage and what guts was required to sail 5,000 miles across the high seas because you may never come back. So it is not resources that win you laurels. It is not resources that helps you in discovery. It is being resourceful. So you have to be resourceful. So never complain whether in the university here or when you go to your new companies wherever you join that having too much of resources as C.K. Prahla, the great management guru said, having great resources on the one hand, 
no lot of wealth lot of resources and low dreams is the surest way to fail you need to have very small resources and very big dreams that is the best combination to have success so you do not complain is be happy if you get it but do not complain you don't have computer you don't have telescopes you don't have you know all the kind of resources which iit may have not necessary c v raman in 1930s the first man to win the nobel prize for physics had no instruments but he thought beyond the stars and discovered the raman effect on light which was the most revolutionary thing and we haven't had a, a one more nobel prize after that in spite of so much of investment in science and technology so you need to you need to think think you know beyond the worlds to discover new things when newton was asked how did you discover the law of gravity he said by intending my mind all the time my mind i was intending my mind all the time on the problem einstein the greatest scientist of all time said i'm not a genius i'm not a genius i'm infinitely more curious i'm infinitely more curious and i stay with the problem longer so genius is the ability to take infinite pains so you need to stay with the problem that if you want to solve any problem as richard feynman said very famously i am happy with questions that that cannot be answered i am happy with questions that cannot be answered rather than answers that cannot be questioned so you do not want to have someone give you answer which you cannot question you would rather have question that cannot be answered so you must have that inquisitive mind to always question it is as bernard shaw said it is always good to hang a question on things that you have long taken for granted you know a good question mark question sorry bertrand russell said that the great mathematician and nobel laureate it is always good to question things that you have long taken for granted have a question mark don't take everything for granted and you know bernard shaw said very famously you see things and say why you see things and say why i dream things that never were and say why not so you have to always say why not why can't i do this thing which is called impossible so there are always three stages in your in your in any venture that you start the first stage is ridicule people will think you are a madman or a mad girl the next is opposition people will oppose you, oppose you they oppose you then the last is they will follow you so you need to you need to have that ability to face challenges and also ability to face criticism because the world will criticize you you cannot be a conformist you cannot be a yes man you have to question any precept any kind of answers like given to you think yourself thinking yourself is the best way to find answers this is not to say that you should disrespect a guru but you have to learn from the guru and then think for yourself so from my village i i went to sanic school in bijapur and i just want to tell you that the first 3 uh, years because i was there only for 3 years from the my 7th uh, standard to 10th standard they were all in tents because there was no college premises so our class was held in tents and of course now i just went to give a ted talk in sanic school just 2 uh, months ago now they got a big 500 acre campus uh, with horses and swimming pool and everything but then we were in a college campus which was given to us there was not enough accommodation it was in tents 
but we had the greatest of teachers. So great education is what remains with you after you have forgotten everything that you have learnt. And what is it that remains with you and remained with me is the values that they teach you, the values of hard work. There is no shortcut even for a genius without hard work. Hard iron labour will always stand you in good stead. A man resolved to do iron labour is equal to achieve anything in life. Just remember this. You cannot achieve things by fluke. You may, that will not last. It will be like a bubble. But you resolve yourself. Hard labour, iron labour, which requires that you have to face boredom, you have to give up your partying, give up your WhatsApp. That requires your determination to sit tight and plot through whether it is research or your business or whatever you have. That will conquer the world. They conquer who believe they can conquer. So that has to happen if labor goes with that. So I joined the National Defense Academy from Sainik School and from there I went to the Indian Military Academy in Dehradun and our, uh, the war broke out in Pakistan. And one of the things one of my officers told me was that if you are leading men as an officer, you have to be better than him in whatever you are doing. If he marches 10 kilometers, he should be able to march 20 kilometers. If he rides horses morning to night, you have to ride the horses night to night till morning. You should go without food before, he, before uh, ensuring that he eats first. In anything that you do, you have to lead by example. Then only you will be able to lead your men in war. And I still remember those words. And that was true when I came back to farming. That is true when I took to my business. So you need to be working harder. You need to labor harder. You have to be better, working longer hours, have more passion than the people whom you command. So after the war, I was in various parts of uh, India. I was in Bhutan, I was in Sikkim, at the high altitude in the Chinese border. Then I went to Kashmir. Then along the way, I also did a 4,000 kilometer motorcycle trip uh, across the entire North India from Rajasthan. I wanted to see and learn about India, its villages, its temples and its architecture. So I took my backpack, I took a tent and went all around North India. Then I did the same in South India. Then I went for f four months to USA on a, uh, a, a, a hitchhiking trip. And I was in my sister's house. And one day, uh, somebody, my sister's husband was in the World Bank. He came to me and he says, Captain, are you going to be here e meeting Ramaswamy and Kupuswamy and eating Idli Vada Sambar or are you going to see America? So I suddenly it sort, of, sort of shook me up. I went and bought a backpack, a tent, and bought some camping kit because I had the army experience. And I took a Greyhound bus pass, and I hitchhiked and trekked from Washington, D.C., all across America, to New York, to Ohio, to Chicago, to Grand Teton National Park, went to San Francisco, then Hollywood, and then came back. All this were great education for me in opening my mind to the rest of the world. You have to, like the Rig Veda says, you have to let noble thoughts come to us from all sides. That is written in the parliament. There is a, in, the, in Sanskrit, Ano Bhadra Kritava Vishwataha. Let noble thoughts come to us from all sides. Even Vivekananda said that. Open your windows, open your doors. Let new ideas come to us. Because the greatest spiritual adventure of India were the with Vedas and the Upanishads which was a spiritual quest to know the meaning of life. Why the Hinduism has withstood 5,000 years of various invasion and onslaughts because it assimilated, it absorbed like October your past said, the Nobel laureate Indian culture, Indian Civilization is like the bow constrictor. It can swallow anything, swallow anything and digest itself. 
it is not the same yet the same ever changing ever renewing ever morphing itself ever rejuvenating but yet it has never shut its door anybody it gave birth to new religions it spawned in its from its very womb new religions buddhism jainism the charavakas were there the nihilists every kind of philosophy was there and then you had uh, sikhism it absorbed even if you go to any temple here yeah, i'm not sure in bhubaneswar in, in the belor and halebi temples in in karnataka you can see buddha they didn't go to hang him like what happened in israel when the jews hanged christ when buddha came they said we have 33 crore gods we'll have one more so they have put him as one more avatara in the temple so so we need to have that magnanimity and the largeness of spirit to to welcome ideas but to stand on our own feet to absorb what is good and become better by absorbing other ideas and not become a enclosed an enclosed society because indian art indian culture indian literature it is so rich every state has such rich literature including orissa as we know the temples here so we have to have that same attitude in your studies you have to study but go beyond your studies that is what will stand you in good stead as einstein said you have to be infinitely more curious you have to be infinitely more curious so you have to look at other things beyond your textbooks that is what will make your life enriching that will also help you in, in choosing your best career because the the ability to navigate this world because this world is treacherous as john kennedy said life is unfair you are going to have failures in life you are going to have pitfalls you are going to have disappointments you you going to fall but it is not the falling you are not a failure when you fall you are not a failure when you fall i am telling this because many of you who may not get your first rank who may not get your gold medal tomorrow who may have not done so well i have seen in my own life the most ordinary students have have done something extraordinary i said was an ordinary student so you may fall but you are not a failure you are a failure only when you quit so victor hugo said it is not the glory of man is not in never falling the glory of man is not in never falling but to rise each time he falls so each time you fall you have to rise that is the art of life that is the art of business and enterprise and art of whatever venture you may, you may have to start muhammad ali the greatest boxer of all time he 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 lost his boxing crown why because at the height of his boxing glory when he was a world champion he said i do not believe in war and they said we'll put you to jail he said doesn't matter i do not believe in war you are killing vietnamese in america the americans are killing vietnamese i do not believe in it he right or wrong he said i do not believe they said we'll put you in jail they put him in jail he lost his uh, gold medal he was in jail for 3 years but then the whole country rose against the war they said no this war is unjust then they released him he came back trained again won became a champion then lost his championship and trained again got beaten got his jaw broken fell again rose again and became a world champion again so you need to have that kind of resilience that kind of courage to believe in what what you think is sacred to you and fight for those truths which you think which you think are sacred truths which have been given to you from ages or given to you from your parents or from your teachers so i one day said i have had 8 years of army life 8 years of training 16 years i must do something on my own i was restless i wanted to do something on my own so i i resigned with 6300 rupees because in those days uh, in 1978 the salary of an ias officer an ips officer army officer was about 
thousand, three hundred thousand, four hundred rupees. And since I did not put in pensionable service, I only got gratuity, which is equal to your salary, last drawn basic salary into the number of eight years. I got, I got six thousand, seven hundred rupees, and I came home. I did not believe that I will not succeed. It never crossed my mind that I will not succeed. I said, if I have spent eight years of training, the best institutions, the best teachers, and my father was the greatest teacher, and my father said, dream but not envy, dream but not envy, and if you fail, do not despair. Do not lose yourself in despair, in, in, you know, in, in crying. Lose yourself in action. You have to lose yourself in action. And I said, how can I fail? I got so much of rich experience in my life. I cannot fail. You, the, uh, you know, so I, I left with that 6,000 rupees. I came to a village and I found that all the lands in my family were submerged under a dam. And um, they had given lands in some other remote area, which were barren lands, which um, Mr. Zahu will know. And that's the reason you have this uh, rebellion by the forest tribals against uh, corporates, um, sometimes with the help of government, sometimes, you know, corporate greed. They come and do mining. And in the name of development. But what happens to individual lives? The people there are uprooted. The, if they are tribal people, the tribal people are uprooted from their uh, forest dwellings. And if a dam is built, like in our case, 60 villages were submerged. My village was spared, but all our lands were submerged. And what does the government do? Why I'm telling this is that some of you may join IAS, IPS, maybe corporates. You must have this empathy. This empathy to people, what happens to your actions when you take action. So this village, which was submerged, they had to get lands again. So when you build a dam, you lose fertile lands and you also lose forest lands. Then the government gives lands in another place, which is again either forest lands or what they call in Canada, the commons, the gomana, the grasslands. In Karnataka, we had thousands of acres of grasslands which the villagers were uh, uh, tilling. So these lands were given to these uh, 60 villages. So about 3,000 acres was given to this two, three villages where my lands were also submerged. And I asked my father what happened to our land. He said, we have lost it. And where are the new lands? He said, it's in a remote area. There's no road. There's no, there's no electricity there. There's no drinking water. So what are you going to do? Agriculture is difficult even for us. We have inherited lands, it's difficult for us. What will you do in this barren land? You can't reach there, you have to go walking. So I said, have you seen it? He said, no, we have not seen it. So I just said, Mike, this is something for me to do. I took my uncle, had a mo bullet motorcycle, I went to that lands with a village accountant, the motorcycle could not go. I walked those five kilometers, I stood on a hill and saw a beautiful stream and lovely lands there. And I just was overcome with this emotion. I said, I can convert this barren land into a coconut plantation. There were just thick thorns, but it was also grazing lands. So I made up my mind. As I was dreaming, I was also planning. I, I thought of dairy farm, I thought of a sericulture farm, coconuts, bananas, a whole lot of things. I had just made a plan for myself. And the plan was that I'll plant coconuts. It'll take 10 years. Then I'll also do poultry, I'll do dairy. So dairy will give me daily milk, poultry will give me once a month, sericulture will give me once a month, bananas will give me once a year. I made some kind of a, you know, as some said, a, a madman's dream. And I went to Bangalore, bought a tent, bought an army, had an army rifle, I had a, I bought a dog, and took a Harijan boy from my village, who was about 14, and he was uh, in the village, you know, doing what is known as bonded labor as abolished, but bonded labor existed in, in, because they don't have education. Where will they go? It was abolished. So he was uh, grazing the cattle. 
So he saw freedom for himself along with me. So he came with me. So one day I went and pitched a tent. And that's how my agriculture life began. And uh, of course, like all farmers, I got into debt. I got out of debt. I rose again. I fell again. But I did not give up. Someone said, vision is the art of seeing the invisible. It's a, it's a kind of irony because of paradox. You know, vision is seeing. But he said, vision is the art of seeing the invisible. What is the invisible? Invisible is the future. So, you, you are looking at a future that what you are seeing which others are not seeing. So I said, I must create my own future. Like Lincoln said, the best way to predict your future is to create it. So you create your future. That's the reason I also tell people in the engineering college or in software, you know, you, you not enough to write your software, you have to script your future. And to script your future, you have to be involved in, in, in civic society without getting into politics. You should be involved in civic society so that you can build a better society. Only then you can script your future. You know, you can't just be complaining all the time. Things are bad, politics is bad, bureaucracy is bad. Of course, but there are always good people. So cynicism is slow suicide. You know, just sitting in front of the TV and criticizing all the time, that is slow suicide. You have to be involved in making this a better world. To whatever extent possible, you have to strive every day when you wake up with enthusiasm. Nothing is ever achieved in this world without enthusiasm. That is the continued wisdom of all ages. You have to rise every day. Regardless of the setback, you have to rise every day with enthusiasm. And I always quote the farmer. The farmer is the best teacher for us because he never loses his optimism. You have, of course have stray suicides. The farmer never loses because in spite of floods, in spite of drought, he rises every morning with his, even today, when I go to my farm, with his wife in tow, and sometimes with another child, they rise in the morning, go with the bullocks, and plow every day, never disbelieving the sun will not rise, never disbelieving it will not rain next year because it did not rain last year, and never, never doubting that the seeds he sprouts, the seeds that he sows will not sprout. So that optimism is needed. So you cannot, those of you who want to become entrepreneurs, you cannot be an entrepreneur if you do not have optimism. You have to have optimism that things are bad, there's corruption, there's dishonesty, but in the end things will mend. Because I'm going to work to making, making this better and I'm not going to give up. Because I'm superstitious in that way that if 10 doors close, the 11th will always open. Exactly like what happened with Draupadi, when she had given up everything, you know, Krishna came and gave that sari. Or in that Gajendra Moksha, when everything was gone, he, the Vishnu Chakra came and saved him. So you have to believe that, that the harder you work, the luckier you get. And it's true. The harder you get, the luckier you get. So, in that spirit, I rose every day and lost crops, but in the end, you know, I made some success of it. I didn't become rich, I, I, I made some success of it. The gate, you, the gates to he, the, the, the way to heaven, they say, is through the gates of hell. So you have to go through hell to reach heaven. When I say hell, it could be hard work, it could be obstacles in your, in your path. There will be some MLA who will be against you, there will be some boss who will be against you, some superior who will not... Uh, I, I hear it from my own children. My, my daughter calls and says, I have this boss of mine who is impossible, he is misbehaving. No, but I tell her, it's okay. Stand up for yourself. You don't have to bend your head down. But be optimistic. Things will change. You can't give up. So, with that kind of attitude of resilience in life, you have to pursue your dreams. Anyway, at the end of uh, uh, seven years, but I missed a story here. When I was in the tent with my boy, 
the Harrison boy and um, one day my father wrote to me saying that you know it's time you get married I said no I'm in a barren land in a tent you know how do I get married and I don't have a bungalow I don't have a pension I don't have you know I have to, uh, I have to earn money the income is still not steady then he just said one sentence he said does it mean the poor people do not marry or cannot marry how does a poor laborer marry if if you say the you, you can't marry because you're poor then all the poor people must be bachelors so he said you should marry so then he wrote to my wife's father saying that uh, he is saying that uh, you know he still not having a good income and steady do you still want to come and and um, my wife who sits here she she took a bold step and said yeah, i'd like to come, I'd like to come and meet So they came and I met her in my village first and I had gone in my motorcycle there I met her and then I said you must come and see my place because there's nothing there. I'm in a tent and I'm still removing the th th you know bush and things like that. She said it's okay but she asked me what do you do for money? She said no I'm trying to grow crops and I'm going to have a dairy, I'm going to have a poultry, I'm, you know one fails, there's another backup, if that fails there's another backup. Um, but you have to come and see. So she came along with her mother in by bus and her father and her sister. And um, I, uh, the, the road was impossible. Um, and I was thinking, how do how do I get her here? I'm a neighbor, Mr. Manjagoda, a great farmer. I mean, I mean, I was also farming, but he was a farmer, you know, deep-chested, courageous, solid farmer who would work morning till night. And he said, Sir, I have a bullock cart. So he gave his bullock cart. And uh, he put a dhari on it, a chape, a mat. And he told his son, Sheena, go and uh, this one. So he, he, we went in the motorcycle there in advance. And they got on the bullock cart. And that bullock cart, you know, the old bullock carts, not the tired ones, they are made of wooden... Uh, 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 wheels with a steel uh, rim around it and uh, it makes a noise and with the bell and the sound of the gutted roads. So so we came, the bullock cart was coming and we were sitting and suddenly we could hear the bullock cart was coming and then suddenly Mahesh Manjagoda shot through the roof and he said, Oh my God, you fool! You have not put the pin on the bullock cart's wheels. You know, in, in the wheels you put two pins, it's called as Kadani in Kannada, so that the wheel doesn't come off. So, I think that's why, I don't know how the wheels did not come off. Those five kilometers up and down through all the ruts, the wheels held and she and her mother and her father came, otherwise, I think they would have, somebody would have broken the hip. And I think, that's why they say probably the marriages are made in heaven. And, and uh, so she came and uh, she saw the place. And so in, in that sense, I think um, she believed in what she saw, probably. Uh, but I think she believed in the heart that um, that we can make a good life. And so in that sense, she is um, more courageous than me. If I were her, maybe... <laughs> maybe I wouldn't have had the same courage if I were in her place. Uh, but anyway, so I... I did various things. Let me c cut the story short. I had given a, my book to the, um, the uh, 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 Vice Chancellor for your library. Those of you who have time can read it. Um, it is um, more uh, thrilling than the movie. They, they, said they spoke about the movie. The movie is heavily fictionalized. It has the essence of it, of, uh, of the triumph of spirit over adversity, triumph of courage over uh, uh, defeat, uh, defeatist mentality. But I think my own life, our own life was more, more challenging, more, uh, with more obstacles than what is shown in the film. Uh, but it kept the spirit of the, our life together. Then, um, so I had a motorcycle dealership, I had a UDP hotel, I had a stockbroking company, I had an agriculture consultancy company. I did various things because my farm was not giving me enough income. And I think today, it is important that for our agriculture, because we see so much of distress in agriculture, so much of distress, 
that I have not seen any farmer. Big farmers are okay, but they are also, also under loss. The small farmers, they are not in a position to send their children to good schools. They are not in a position to, uh, you know, if their marriage comes, if their function happens, if there's, if there's some kind of a, a disease, their agriculture income will not support them. They borrow money, they end up in a, a, a debt trap, which eventually sometimes turns into a death trap. So farmers must engage in allied activities which can give them some kind of income. But of course when you have a farmer with one acre, two acre, half acre, very difficult for him to make his ends meet. I think that is the empathy that those of you who are now passing out of these colleges here, good colleges, you are lucky, you are fortunate. So always count your blessings because you are so fortunate to have got this admission here where your father is supporting you. But there are millions of others. On the one hand, there is huge wealth creation in India, huge wealth creation. On the other hand, in parallel, there is huge poverty. India is also today the most poor nation in terms of numbers, sheer numbers. The number of people individually below poverty line, the percentage of people in poverty compared to our population, the malnutrition of uh, women, uh, mothers, uh, infant mortality, death, in all these, India's uh, record is very, very low. It's as low as many African countries. So you have to keep that in mind. There is a forest officer here whom I met many years ago. And uh, she took me to some tribal areas then to encourage tourism for ho homestay when I was running Edekan. So those are the kind of things we need to do to get them self-employed in addition to agriculture. Uh, I'm mentioning this because sometimes we tend to forget it in our uh, newfound education and newfound sometimes arrogance that uh, the villagers are, you know, uh, backward. They are backward because of us. So I came to uh, my came to Bangalore after about ten years after making my farm a success, uh, but it's still not a success in that sense of becoming totally. Um, you know, viable because there was a drought, there's all kind of problems. But anyway, I came to Bangalore um, because by which time I had, I had had five, six experiences of businesses, I wanted to do something big. So I went to China in 1996, uh, sorry, 1995 with a delegation of farmers. And when I went to China with a delegation of farmers, I stayed there for one month and I stayed with the Chinese farmers. I visited a lot of Chinese farms deep in the interiors. And in that Taluk headquarters where I was staying, this I'm talking 1995, China, which is a communist country, which had just 10 years earlier had embraced capitalism. That means they had a communist ideology in terms of politics. That means communist political party is the only party that will rule. You criticize it, you'll be put to jail. But as long as you don't criticize the government, it is a totally unabashed, shameless, capitalist country. So wherever I went, I found construction. 150 kilometers from Canton to uh, Hong Kong. It was 150 kilometers of continuous construction activity of granite and marble, granite marble cutting without gap. Because that much of production was happening. And in the Taluk headquarters where I was staying, there were karaoke bars, there were nightclubs, there were, um, you know, um, belly dancers. And uh, <coughs> in my hotel desk, there was a notebook which read, it said, single window agency for investments. That was China. And I said, oh my God, I said, this is, why are we like this? Because we were still very socialist in one way and democratic and free market in another way in India. But so much of bureaucracy was there, so much of state control was still existed. Um, so, so somehow it sort of flashed on me that India will not remain in isolation. If China is, like Russia has a rivalry with America, 
France is England. I said India is China, not Pakistan in terms of. So we can't remain in isolation. There will be only one caste in the future. Even even today we are fighting elections on caste, which is our biggest curse. But there will be only one caste, which will be the consumer caste. We don't see today when a nurse comes, you know what's the religion? If somebody gives you blood, you do not find out whether it is from a Muslim or a untouchable. You do not. You do not um, uh, uh, ask. You know who is the pilot, who is flying you. You, when you go to a restaurant, though in the villages this exists, in the in the in the restaurants, you eat the, in the best restaurant that you go to. You don't ask the caste of the person. So I realize that the consumer caste will force people to change their policies, for force the politicians, because already. There were changes happening in Karnataka. Karnataka was competing with uh, Hyderabad for IT. Chief ministers realized they can't come back to power if they can't create jobs, so they had to create jobs. And public sector was not able to create jobs, and private sector was coming in. That's when this idea came to me, because just before that, when I had come to Bangalore, I was with a friend of mine who was a helicopter pilot, and we both said. Why don't we start a helicopter company? Because he was not getting a job, and I found he was not getting a job for one year. Every day he would come and say, "I'm looking for a job," and one day he said he got a job, and that job was a, as a security officer, come administrative officer. I was shocked. He was an outstanding pilot. He was a gallantry award winner. He was still young, a wonderful chap, a great leader, and I said, "Let's start a helicopter company." And then I was in China. I saw this one newspaper cutting. Of a Vietnamese girl who had gone to uh, France after America had bombed uh, Vietnam and completely razed it to the ground. There are a lot of orphans who had lost their parents. One child who was two years old was taken to France, and when America withdrew and peace was restored, they wanted to rebuild Vietnam. So this girl had become in France a pilot. So the French company took her because she was Vietnamese. And I read the sentence that they could not step out of the hotel anyway because all the roads and bridges, everything was demolished, and the countryside is full of mines, land mines. So the only way to go from place to place was through helicopter. And I said, then in Karnataka and had also travelled all over India, our country is not bombed, but our infrastructure is as bad. So. In every obstacle, there is an opportunity. If there is no power, we can get into solar. If there are no roads, maybe helicopter is the answer. If it takes long, t eight days for going by train, go by go by air. But how do you make it affordable? Because you say I'm going to ha have a Benz car, and only one company will manufacture Benz cars, then. Then you, you, then the Benz company will go bankrupt unless you know government gives you a subsidy. So you need competition, and and in my case, it was competition with the railways, because the other three airlines were very high cost airlines. So I came back with this idea, and like it always happened, as I was dreaming, I was already planning. So I came back and I told my friend, let us start a helicopter company. I did not know then. How much does a helicopter cost? Thank God I did not know, because if I had known and gone to a consultant or a, you know, McKinsey or somebody, they would ask for a couple of crores, and I did not even have a few lakhs in my pocket. But the idea was so powerful. The dream must possess you in a very Vedantic way. You must become the dream. The dream must become you. There cannot be any. Dvaita, it cannot be a duality. You should become one. You should be so obsessed to the point of madness. You don't think of anything else. That's when you can become an entrepreneur, or become a great scientist, or a great author. I remember K. V. Puttapa once, of the greatest Kannada poet, who translated the Ramayana Darshanam into poetry from the original Sanskrit. In one speech, he said that. Uh, I was called by this institution from the last university for the last twelve years. I could not even answer their letter. I did not come. You must have thought I am very arrogant. But today, on the fourteenth year, like Manvas, I am coming because for fourteen years 
I was involved in writing the Ramayana Darshanam. So that is the kind of immersion you must have. You have to immerse yourself and lose yourself in action of whatever undertaking you are doing. So this thing, you know, I was possessed with that. So I came back and uh, then we set about. So I will not spoil the story by telling you how I got the money because everyone asks, you had no money, you are son of a, f a teacher, how did you do this? Such a capital intensive industry. But you know, if you have an idea, you have the brains, somebody has the money. So somebody puts the money into your ideas and what do you do? You sell him your dreams. You sell him your dream so that he puts money. And then what do you give in return? You give him shares in your company. So I had 100% of the company. So if the first guy put something like about 20 lakhs. The second person put 50 lakhs. To each of them I gave some shares. And then eventually I raised, you know, totally about 1000 crores. All by giving more shares and more equity and more shares. So in that sense you have to be selling your dreams all the time to someone or the other. Even there is a great story of this Sony guy who did the PlayStation. Even within the company, he was an employee. He came with this idea of PlayStation. Everybody snubbed him. But he did not give up. For five years, he went after within the company, within Sony, saying that, give me this chance, give me this chance. And somebody one day heard him and said, okay, this is the budget. You build the PlayStation. Then the PlayStation became such a big hit, it, 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 it almost became 30% of Sony's 80 crores revenue. So you can be entrepreneurial wherever you are, as a teacher, as a you know, a bureaucrat, or, or as an entrepreneur. So I'm just the reason I'm not restricting my story to entre entrepreneurship. So we eventually launched with uh, after. Um, but what I want to tell you is that it took us three years the first time with the helicopters and uh, to get a license. Three years. And if you go with a suitcase to Delhi or in the state ca capital, Bhuneshwar or Bangalore, if the state state come, then they'll a full and this money are soon parted, as they say. Somebody will take that money and disperses you of that money because you want it in a hurry or you're cutting short corners, so you want to give money and get your job done. So we had no money. We were so fired with our zeal and so fired with our dream for India, our, our own ethics or whatever. I said we will not bribe, whatever happens, but we will not give up. So like Vivekananda said in one other place, stop not till the goal is achieved. Many people come to me and say, I'm doing this job. I'm also starting a company. When the company does well, I leave my job. I say both will fail. You are doing disservice to your company and you are doing greater disservice to the job who is paying you. Either don't do your enterprise, do your job or leave your job because it's only when you, when you, like the bird, the first day it flies out of the nest. Any of you who have seen National Geographic can see it. One day when the mother flies out of the nest, the bird jumps out. Of course, a, a, a few birds will die. But that's how they learn to fly. You have to discover and find your wings after you jump out of the nest. You cannot find your wings if you are in the nest. You can't discover new lands if you are on the shore. So if you are starting on an enterprise, starting on any venture, you have to take that plunge. We asked Naipaul, the great Nobel laureate, in one of his speech, he said, how did you discover writing? He said, he said, I wanted to be a writer. How did you discover these themes? He said, I had a room above BBC in London. So I wanted to write. So every day I would go, sit and tear the paper. He said, for nine months, nothing came out. But, but one day, on the tenth month, suddenly it flew out of my this one. And I discovered the themes as I wrote. So he wrote to discover the themes. So you need to, in that same sense and spirit, 
you need to discover your your inner talent there is a there is a talent in each of us there is a uh, talent which is uh, dormant in each of us in some it expresses itself but everyone has a talent but you do not know what is that nor will you know unless you attempt it so you have to attempt it you have to embark on that to discover your talent so we three years at the end of three years i still remember i went to your minister uh, because the secretary kept sending me back one day i told the secretary uh, i think his name was bejil i remember he said captain don't come to me again i have put your file on the minister's table now what happened he said he has he has not signed it he has not rejected it which means that he is expecting something so i said well, no tell him he said i am not going to tell him he will think i am expecting something if i push your file the minister will think i am expecting something so i will not tell him i have done my job i have put your file in the minister's thing so i burst into the minister and uh, we know there is corruption in politics but sometimes i say why should i take it from this man i'll take it from some other industrialist industrialist will come poor good put money in i went and i shouted at him i said you are making these speeches so i really lost my temper he says captain saab beto aram se get him some money you know so where is your file i said i don't know your secretary is on your table so he called the secretary he he knew where the file was and the file said sir there he is why didn't you come to me earlier and he signed it so what i want to say is that even today it's possible to get your job done without paying though the feeling is it's almost impossible <laughs> the not me there are many who have done it it could be narayan murthy who, who is in whole story he tells you there's one mustafa maybe you should get him on it to talk to you who uh, has got this company called id id is it called that idli um it's called uh, id he is a uh, i think i am graduate or iit graduate he has set up a he is a son of a laborer he has set up a company that makes uh, ready to cook idlis ready to uh, ready to eat uh, parathas ready to eat uh, dosas and vadas and things that and i think he is doing a thousand crores of revenue so there are people who are great entrepreneurs who have done it honestly without bribing so we should not get into this trap saying that i do not have connections i don't have money i have to bribe there are it's always there like purandar das has said in one famous song satyavantarige idu kalavalla this is not an age of honest people that he said 1000 years ago even ghalib said the same thing you know so the world has always been like that but it's for you to to b- b- believe in yourself and make the changes that are required so i would like to end my talk because i think i've spoken little more than my allotted time i would like to end my talk and say that it was true then it's true today it will be true tomorrow passion and energy and commitment that means dedication or shraddha or devotion passion energy and commitment is more important than capital if you have the first three the capital will come like the river flows to the sea that will seek you capital will seek you or the opportunities will seek you like tagore said the best will find you you don't choose the best the best finds you and in another very famous line he says you have to do what you should he he says the night sky tagore says the night sky is talking to the stars and the stars say let me let me light my lamp let me le- the, the the stars are the stars are telling the sky because the sky is asking what the hell are you doing he says let me light my lamp and never debate if it will help to remove darkness so you never ask whether <laughs> so you never ask when you want to do a good thing will it solve problem of honesty in the world 
if you want to prevent one evil deed, if you want to save one man who is getting, let us say, it is a communal conflict, there is a Hindu getting attacked by a Muslim, which came recently in a story in now in Haryana, or a Muslim getting attacked for cow lynching, or a communal flare up. You never ask, what, what is the point of saving this one Muslim or one, one Hindu? Will it help remove evil? No. You have to light a candle, even if it is a single candle. And uh, uh, in the end, I would like to say that we had a great past. The golden age, they say, is never the present age. But we are of late talking a lot about the golden age, the golden age. Yes, it was the golden age. 5,000 years ago, in the Mohenjo-daro, we had the bronze castings, when bronze castings were unknown in the world. Even the most ancient civilizations of Egypt and Babylon did not have bronze castings. India had it. It had drainage. But today, most of our, today, when we went to the moon, most of our villages, whether in the north or south, do not have good drainage. So, what I want to say is, the golden age for India was there. It was a great age. It was an age which we had to be proud of because we can't abandon tradition. Tradition is a tree better than the seed. Is a seed better than the tree? You know, one is born out of the other. So, we need to respect tradition, but Indian culture, the Sanatana Dharma, as Ambedkar said recent in one of his books, is ever evolving. It is not cast in stone. It has always evolved. From the Upanishadic times, new people, new literature, new art, everything has come. It is superimposed. So the golden age for India, I want to make this again and again loud and clear. The golden age for India is not behind us but ahead of us and you should all create it. Thank you.